Okay, back to David Hume. Um, David Hume, as I talked about in the last lecture, uh, using the Hume's, his Hume's fork, uh, show that there's no, we have no reason to believe rationally in causation, causality, that everything causes something, everything has a cause and everything has an effect, and we have no reason to believe in induction. Uh, that's David Hume. And let me go over Hume's fork very brief, briefly again. Hume's fork is that all, uh, all of our, all knowledge is either one of two sorts. It's either uh, matters of fact, based upon which we know from experience, matters of fact, um, based upon which begins with sense perception. The only way I can know that the cat is on the mat, for example, is if I look to see if the cat is on the mat. The only way I, I can know that it's raining outside is if I look. The only way I can know that there's an apple here is if I look. That's matters of fact. They can only be known through actual looking, <clears throat> through observation. Kant would say, you, Immanuel Kant uses the word, they can be known a posteriori, meaning they can only be known from after. That's what it means in Latin, from after looking. You have to observe. To know that it's raining outside, you have to look. You can only know that it's raining outside a posteriori from after observing. On the other hand, there are I, there are things that we that are relate. We can some knowledge takes the form of relation of ideas. I, one idea is related to another idea, and for example, all cir, cir, a circle is round. Okay, so um, that these are relations of ideas relations of ideas and we can know these a priori without looking that's what that means a priori from before looking you can know if i say i drew a circle without looking you could tell me that that circle is round how do you know that because the very idea of a circle includes its being round if i say i drew a triangle without looking you could tell me that it has three sides because that's what a triangle by definition means. It means it has three sides. These are simply things we can know in, in, by understanding what the word means. If I tell you <clears throat> somebody is a bachelor, by definition, that person is not married and it's a male. These are true by definition. So some things are relations of ideas. Some things we can are matters of fact. They, they can only be known by observation. If I tell you that a, a certain number is larger than another number, and that number is larger than another number, so I say A is greater than B is greater than C, then simply by understanding what great if what understanding what greater than means, if A is greater than B and B is greater than C, then you can know without uh, uh, any observation that A is greater than C. So these are, this is Hume's fork. And Hume says, given using Hume's fork, he says we, uh, using that principle, uh, go over all the libraries and uh, throw out everything that is not either, a, any book that talks about something which is not either a matter of fact or a relation of ideas, you could commit it to the flames. That's David Hume. Two of the things that he commits to the flame are our belief in causality, that everything has a cause, everything has an effect, and our belief in induction, that we can actually predict the future based upon the past. So, for example, Hume would say, if I asked you what's going to happen when I let go of this apple, you will tell me, everybody will tell me it's going to fall. And in fact, it did fall. Hume would say, we have no reason to believe, we have no reason to believe that. We do believe it. Hume believed it himself, but he says the reason he believes it is out of human instinct, custom, habit. But he's not justified rationally in believing that when I let go of this apple, it will fall. He says, imagine Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam has never seen an apple, anybody let go of an apple, and he would have no idea what's going to happen. And Hume says, we are in exactly the same position of Adam. We have no idea either. The only reason we believe it's going to fall is because we are basing our belief upon past experience. We've seen it fall many, many times, and there we, before we conclude that it's going to fall the next time. And Hume says, why, what, how, why are we justified in believing that? 
<clears throat> so when you reason concerning matters of fact, Hume says we assume all re reasoning concerning matters of fact uh, are based upon our belief in causality, ca causality, that everything causes something else. If, every, if, if things just happen by pure accident, then you would have no idea what's going to happen. But since we believe that everything has a cause and effect, it, the, Hume calls the causality the cement to the universe. Everything is connected in terms of ca cause and effect. We, as physicists say, they say gravity makes the apple fall. And but our, and our, 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 why do we believe in causality? Why do we believe in causality? Hume says from experience. Uh, the reason uh, scientists, for example, came up with the idea of gravity is that they obs observed regular regularities. Uh, they would never have come up with the idea of gravity if apples didn't always fall. If <laughs> one day an apple would go this way, one day they go that way, that way, that way, you know. The reason scientists come up with scientific laws is because they observe regular regularities. So that's where you, so our belief in causality is based upon regular uh, experience. But then what, what justifies us from uh, using our experience to talk about the future? Because when uh, you might say, well, you know, when I ask you what's will this what's going to happen with this apple, you say it's going to fall. I say why, and you say well because of experience. Every time I let go of it, it falls. And then Hume would say, well, why do you believe that it's going to fall the next time? Because that's the future. We have never experienced the future. So you have to say well, you have to then what you say, you assume that the future future will resemble the past. And then Hume says, what? Why do you believe that? And and you have no reason, you have no justification for that. It's just experience doesn't tell you that the future will resemble the, the future will resemble the past because we've never experienced the future. So you're in a vicious circle. Okay, that's Hume. Now you might say that's really weird. I mean, uh, uh, science, no, uh, no, no, uh, scientist is going to take that seriously. Obviously, Hume is just uh, they make, coming up with these ridiculous puzzles. I mean, scientists get on with the business of understanding the world. David Hume's talking about we have no, we we can't know that an apple is going to fall, and yet scientists they 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 don't worry about that nonsense, right? They get on and they start they they they, they uh, create uh, uh, under they create laws of physics, the law of uh, gravity. Uh, they they come up with uh, uh, scientific theories. So, you know, scientists don't have time for all this uh, Humean nonsense. We, we can't know anything about the, uh, we can't know that apples are going to fall. We can't know anything about that. It's just all human instinct. That sounds ridiculous. But let me say something about that. Because a lot of people might look at David Hume and say, that, that's nice for philosophy. You know, we sit in your, your, your uh, room and uh, philosophize about the world. But scientists, they don't take that seriously. Uh, well, let me tell you something. They do take that seriously. Uh, I, Albert Einstein, in anybody's uh, uh, estimation, is a great scientist, right? I mean, he's one of the greatest. Newton, Einstein. Einstein said uh, in one of his writings, he said that there were a couple people. David Hume was one of them. Einstein said that if it wasn't for David Hume, and he mentioned a couple other people, but he 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 signaled, he's he's uh, singled Hume out. He said, if it wasn't for reading David Hume when he was like a teenager, 18, 19, whatever, if it wasn't for him reading David Hume, basically reading what I've just been going over here about how Hume says we we can't know, you know, that the apple is going to fall because <clears throat> we have no reason to believe in induction. We have no reason to believe in causality. Einstein, uh, said that if it wasn't for reading David Hume, he would never have had the courage to question Newton. That is something coming from Einstein. So if you if you hear anybody say that, oh, David Hume, this is all philosophy. It means nothing. And people like Krauss, uh, if you know anything about Krauss, he's constantly belittling philosophy. Well, it's kind of nonsensical of him because Einstein did not belittle it. Chomsky doesn't belittle it. Uh, Philosophers of the stature of Hume ask questions that need to be asked. And Einstein read Hume <clears throat> and he was completely blown away by Hume because Hume asks questions. He de Hume doesn't take anything for granted. And Einstein didn't take anything for granted either. You know, everybody takes for granted space and time. They're different things. Einstein questioned things that everyone takes for granted. And that's what Hume did. He questioned 
what we take for granted. Everybody takes for granted that we we can understand causality with no big problem. For Hume, it was a problem. Hume said we have no reason to believe, no reason to believe in causality or induction. Now, Immanuel Kant comes along, and Immanuel Kant read Hume, just like Einstein did. Immanuel Kant is considered the greatest philosopher since Plato and Aristotle. When Kant read Hume, Kant said Hume awakened him from his dogmatic slumber. So when Immanuel Kant read David Hume, he woke up. He said, I was asleep intellectually. So when you, for example, reading David Hume today, uh, if you read Hume and, and you just say, oh, this is kind of boring, well, then the problem is not with Hume, it's with you. Uh, if, you if Hume is not boring, uh, so, you know, it, he wasn't boring for Einstein, he wasn't bor boring for Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant said that Hume, reading Hume, woke him up. And and Hume, and uh, woke him, he, because Kant was just assuming things that Hume said you can't assume. So here's what, uh, uh, briefly, I'll tell you what, what Kant did. What Kant said to Hume about Hume is this. He agreed with that Hume was right about one thing. He said, we have no, there's no reason empirically to believe in cause, cause and effect. Cause, effect. Uh, because we never perceive it. Uh, all we perceive, as Hume says, is constant conjunction. A followed by B. A is followed by B. Let go of apple, apple falls. Let go of apple, apple falls. Put your hand in the fire, hand burns. Put your hand in the fire, hand burns, and so on. Cause and effect. Hume, Kant says Hume is com co completely right. Cause and effect, uh, we never observe. And empiricism is based upon the idea that all knowledge is based upon observation. We never observe. We never have any observation of cause and effect. So how can we believe in it? What Kant said to Hume is this. Hume, you're right. We cause that, Our belief in causality is not based upon observation. You're 100% there. Kant said, though, that you, Kant is a transcendental idealist, meaning he's looking for conditions of the possibility of there being any world in, at all. Now, I'm not going to go into the deals of uh, all the, you know, the technicalities of Kant. It's, it it take a long time, but basically what Kant is saying is that causality, Kant's view is this, the human mind, the human mind is structured in terms of cause and effect. So when we observe the external world, where the world comes to us through kind of the filter of cause and effect. It's like, think of this, think of it this way. If you put purple glasses on and you look at the world, the world's going to be purple, right? Purple, the world will appear purple if you have purple glasses. If you have green glasses, the world will appear green. If you have yellow glasses, it will appear yellow. Immanuel Kant is saying we have cause effect glasses. Now he doesn't put it that way. That I'm just uh, as a, it's a metaphor. He, our mind is structured with it. With uh, is it's built into the mind is cause cause effect. Cause and effect for Kant is not in the world. It's in the mind. And so for Kant also our time and space. Time and space for Kant. Kant does not believe time and space are out here. And this he agrees with Leibniz. Time and space are constructions of the mind. For Kant, cause and effect, we impose it on the world. If, if the world was not structured in terms of cause and effect, there would not be a world. It would be complete, absolute chaos. As Hume says, cause and effect is the cement that binds the world together. You cannot have a world of experience unless it's bound together by cause and effect. Cause and effect... <clears throat> Kant says, agreeing with Hume, it, we cannot discover it in the world. You will never discover it by experience. It is the condition of the possibility of our experiencing anything. That's Kant's unique contribution to philosophy. He was the first person to say that. That the mind is wearing, we have, per, we don't have purple spectacles, we have space-time spectacles, meaning our mind is structured in terms of cause and effect. So when we, when we have input coming from the world that is that that experience is organized in terms of cause and effect. Therefore, we can know before looking that everything in the world is bound together by cause and effect. That's Immanuel Kant. In the next lecture, I'll say a little more about that.